Can you tell a bit about yourself and for how long have you been active in this field of medical cannabis? I work in a cancer institute in a government hospital, uh, primarily in the field of palliative care. My first experience of uh, using cannabis in the context, in a medical con uh, context, was around 2009, maybe something like that with uh, several patients who received cannab cannabis in the context of a medical situation where they were suffering terribly and they had used up all the possible medical interventions available. I remember especially one patient, he, he was one step before committing suicide. After he started using cannabis, his whole life changed dramatically to the extent that he embraced life again. He wanted to continue living, living and uh, functioning. And till, this today, uh, till this day, he's doing much, much better. He's not healed. That in, in his case, it was not a, case, a problem of, uh, that had to do anything with cancer. He had a stroke, a very severe stroke, and he had been suffering for around five years from uh, various symptoms associated with it. He was paralyzed completely on his left side and uh, the muscles were spastic and painful. And in addition, because of uh, damage to certain structures in the brain, he was also suffering of uh, panic attacks. And his uh, doctor, his psychiatrist, tried every possible treatment. He, she tried 18 different drugs to help him with his panic attacks and nothing worked. That was really at the beginning of all those things, and I had uh, samples of cannabis. So I gave him two uh, joints, and I told him to go home and to take two puffs. Mm -hmm. And then after that, after several hours or the day after, to report to me and tell, him, tell me what kind of effect it had. So the next day, his wife calls me up. She was there with him because he was, wasn't independent at all. But she calls up and says, Doctor, I don't know what to do. My husband is sitting in the chair and he's not moving, he's not saying anything, he's not responsive. What should I do? So I asked her, tell me, uh, what did he take? He said, he took that cannabis that you, t that you gave him. He said, yes, how much? She said, only one cigarette. He smoked only one cigarette. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I said, yeah, I said, two puffs, not one cigarette. He's stoned, it's okay, just let him sit there, it'll gradually go away. Mm -hmm. Next day, tell him to take only two puffs and then see what happens. And the next day she calls up again and she says, you know, it makes your hair stand on edge. She says, doctor, I could kiss your feet. I haven't seen my husband like this for so many years. He is relaxed, there's no pain, he's feeling much better. It's something I never believed I would live to see that again. Mm -hmm. It seems like cannabis works uh, on the whole body. It improves our quality of life, actually. I prefer uh, to tell you what was observed. The facts themselves, the observations, have value in themselves. And this is an observation nobody can deny. He was doing much better, and he kept on using the cannabis after that. <clears throat> Among other things, he stopped having uh, panic attacks. And if he felt that a panic attack was coming, he would take two puffs and it would stop the panic. Just like that. So this is not the only way or the best treatment for all panic uh, disorders or whatever. But, I mean, this is a direct report of what happened. That's completely undeniable. And there was no other way to help him have this relief. So for him, it was life or death, mm -hmm. practically, getting the cannabis. And under such circumstances, if a doctor says no, there's no medical, uh, no scientific background, nothing to prove that this is the right thing to do, I mean, it's unacceptable. Because that would have made, uh, put him back into the situation he was before, and taken his, robbed him of his life, which turned out to be accessible to an extent. This is a very strong dilemma, especially when you enter into situations where you have a confrontation with the authorities.
because the authorities say it is not permitted, but the authorities also say that you are responsible for the person's health and well-being. So not to give it to him and then have him commit suicide, is that better? Is that something that the health authorities think is okay? Well, you don't know, it's really a dilemma. Who are you more committed to? Mm -hmm. The regulations uh, that dictate what can and cannot be done formally, or to the well-being which you observe directly mm -hmm. of the patient? Do you think this is a question of human rights? Uh, among other things, definitely. I mean, everybody has a right to have some access to such relief. Definitely, if it's proven to be available. It's not a hypothesis. I'm not saying maybe it will help him. He's getting it and you can see with your own eyes what the difference is. But I think it's one of the most important messages mm -hmm. from your uh, lecture before, that cannabis is safe. The possible side effects are reversible, you said. When you evaluate the safety of a drug, you compare it. It is not something out there in, in empty space. Okay? And all the patients say, the doctor will give me morphine if I don't take the cannabis. I mean, he will take, give me morphine. Now, we know how dangerous morphine is, and you know how much you can become addicted if you take it on a regular basis even if it is only to control your symptoms. It is a problem. You get constipated, uh, you get depressed, it chains your... It, it affects many, many aspects in an undesirable uh, manner. Nobody in the world would say that, that morphine is safer than cannabis. Nobody in the world would say that uh, they know what the long-term uh, effects of uh, taking uh, morphine on a regular basis uh, are expected to be. It hasn't been examined formally. You know from experience that the effects are not necessarily so good. And if you compare the cannabis to morphine, if you compare the safety of cannabis to antidepressants, etc., then obviously the cannabis comes out on the better side, even in association of higher mortality uh, with the use of antidepressants. Which diseases you treat with medical cannabis, but is, let's say, available for patients? The State of Israel has done one thing, and I actually was in a rather unique situation. I was quite early on, towards the end of 2010, one of only a handful of doctors who had the authority to actually give the permits directly to the patient. The other ones had to write letters to representatives of the Ministry of Health and get authorization. It was a whole bureaucratic uh, procedure uh, before the patients got the cannabis. And so it was much easier for me to provide my patients with the cannabis. And obviously I could treat them for all kinds of conditions which otherwise could not get such effective treatment. The cannabis is unique uh, in its ability to control certain symptoms as compared to other medications which are available nowadays. For example, with uh, <coughs> stress and anxiety, patients could not sleep uh, just because of their anxiety after they were told that they have cancer. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about other things like the discomfort that they have during the uh, treatment that they're getting, the chemotherapy. Patients who get the cannabis effectively in the right dose of the right variety, they felt much better than the people who were getting the same treatment uh, on their right and on their left. And they really couldn't understand how the other people weren't taking it as well. Um, and that's a consistent observation, even with the most modern anti-emetic treatment. The evidences of controlled clinical trials are far behind the evidences in practice. Of course. Now in Israel, you asked me before, what are people getting cannabis and what aren't they getting it for? Yeah. So by 2013, they issued a list of uh, diagnoses which uh, serve as an indication to uh, offer cannabis as treatment. Generally, the approach is that uh, the use of cannabis is only the last resort. That is, you have to use every other possible uh, standard medicine uh, intervention before you can offer the cannabis. Even if it's more dangerous than a cannabis, you first, I mean, let, like for inflammatory, ba inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease, in the, what they have written down formally is that a patient first has to undergo 
uh, surgery before they offer cannabis, and it doesn't make sense, but that's what's written down for various reasons. They really want to make it the last resort after everything, all the possibilities have been exhausted. That's a matter of policy. Also, you know, despite everything we say nowadays about respecting patients' rights and everything, that's one of the ridiculous things, you know. We have our patients sign a consent to get chemotherapy and they tell you, look, oh, chemotherapy is like this and that, it can help you in so and so many percent of the cases, but there is also this risk and that's that risk for hospitalization and even of death. But you are a grown-up person, now I have explained all the de these details to you and it's your responsibility to decide if you take the chemotherapy or you don't take it. If the people don't uh, sign, they will not get ke chemotherapy. It is their responsibility because uh, according to the bureaucratic system, there are grown-up people who can make decisions about life and death on their own. With cannabis, it, the opposite happens. The patients come and they say, look, I haven't even tried it. I know that it is good for me. I am a grown-up. I don't want morphine. I refuse to get it. It is my, you can't force me to take it. This is what I want. This is what suits me best. And all of a sudden, they are not treated as grown-ups who have a mind of their own and can decide what they're going to do with their body. All of a sudden, there are subjects and the system will dictate to them what they can and cannot do. From a rational point of view, it doesn't make much sense. Depends from what perspective. I mean, if you are someone interested in a government that can control everything, then uh, maybe it is logical from some, some kind of perspective, but it's not rational from, from the perspective of uh, human rights and uh, basic ethics, mm -hmm. I could say. Local growers are your providers? Yeah, formally authorized growers who are uh, growing with a permit from the government. What do you think are benefits of local uh, production? I mean, where else would it come from? To import it? Why shouldn't you import something that you can grow on your own? I mean, it's easier. Here in yeah, Slovenia, it's, so that's it's why I'm asking. yeah, of course. It's easier to control what you, what what's being grown if you know exactly what. Who is the grower? How he is growing it? You can go and supervise even. You can make sure that they're not spraying it with all kinds of uh, insecticides, pesticides or whatever. You have much more control. Essentially, you could also import uh, products from, uh, from abroad. Uh, but then, uh, th these are technical issues. I mean, the fact is, in Israel, it's also a problem. So, the, the local growers uh, have have to comply with so many rules regarding security and making sure that nobody can come and steal it and use it illegally uh, that it makes the cannabis much more expensive and inaccessible actually or actually uh, inflicts a lot of lo uh, financial losses on these companies. It's all dynamic now in Israel, it's changing as things go and actually all of these companies are gaining, making their income and surviving on operations outside of Israel. Mm -hmm. And in Israel, they're just doing it for the benefit of the population and for other reasons as well. It all started in Israel when Rafael Mishulam isolated THC and then consequently endocannabinoid system was uh, discovered. It's a certain aspect of uh, physiology, of uh, biology of, uh, of organisms, which has uh, gradually, bit by bit, being uh, researched and uh, elaborated, investigated. You know, it's not like uh, discovering America. Can we say that endocannabinoid system is an organic physiological system in our bodies? Very it's much so. I mean, Why is, it, after all, this discovery important for humanity? Because, as it was said here today, uh, in, mentioned in several lectures, it is a major mechanism regulating multiple functions in the organism. It clearly modifies our function uh, in so many uh, aspects. Uh, it, it is important, there's no question about that. Do you think it's important for a doctor who treats patients with cannabis to be professionally qualified about the endocannabinoid system? Or do you think can any doctor prescribe cannabis? That has something to do with philosophy, professional <coughs> philosophy in general. I mean, how you see what a doctor can do and cannot do. If he has read enough and he is uh, well aware of what he is doing, then he 
formally he's allowed permitted to do it so every doctor has to sort of take the responsibility on himself and it depends on the circumstances like um, I introduced a certain pain uh, drug into the hospital um, I, I didn't have extensive experience with that drug but there was a patient uh, with no other option and there was no one else uh, to help me with it so I took that leap and I made the decision and I read about it and I gave it to the patient. Yeah. The doctor has a responsibility. You don't have an official, <laughs> official education for doctors who decide to, no, it's, to work obviously with medical it's good, cannabis? It's good if there is a, a formal system of providing a certain basis of knowledge, but it is not essential. I mean, the question is what the alternative is. If, if uh, the doctor does not have the qualification and the patients then will not have access to something that is the only thing that can help them, then that doesn't make sense. Let the doctor read up and uh, make use of it. If there is an, a possibility to gain such education, so much the better. I mean, the question really is not if there is a piece of a diploma on the wall. Uh, that is always true, uh, although we live in a formal society where such uh, diplomas are often uh, required. That's up to the regulators, really, but I, it's not of essence, actually, to, to making use, to exploiting the benefits that are mm -hmm. in the cannabis. What do, do you think uh, is most important for a kind of efficient, successful uh, yeah. cannabis yeah, treatment? Look, look it's, it's quite obvious. It's communication and trust. If there's no trust, then there's no medicine. Uh, that full stop, that's obvious. And then, beyond that, if the communication is good, then uh, it should be possible for any doctor to make use of cannabis, especially taking into consideration its relative safety. Uh, there are other drugs where, uh, which are much more dangerous than perhaps some uh, restrictions regarding its use are more important. All the speakers, you were talking about the entourage effect? You can take it at face value, it's an observation. You give uh, all the components of the plant, as we know it nowadays, we do not know of any isolated uh, component of the plant that, which will provide a similar effect. If all the components are uh, working synergetically, yeah. and if the natural extracts of the whole plant are more effective, mm -hmm. then I'm wondering, does it make sense to produce single isolated it's a big question. It's a big question. <laughs> um, yeah, well, what can I say? I mean, uh, these are things that have, still have to be demonstrated. Okay, there is a lot of logic to try to uh, produce things on an industrial level because we can't commit all the diminishing. Uh, uh, reserves of agricultural land only to growing cannabis so there will be enough, enough to produce uh, cannabis for all uh, humanity. So it would be good if we could produce the effective cannabinoids otherwise from that perspective. Just like public information, what is let's say a good prevention for healthy endocannabinoid system? Uh, to be happy and live well. The functioning of this endocannabinoid activity is related to the circumstances and it responds. I mean, classical examples is that if you do, if you do exercise and after the exercise, the level of 2-AG will rise significantly in your bloodstream. Just goes to show you that uh, there are physiological ways to affect the profile of the endocannabinoid activity. Do you think that cannabis could be also some basic nutrition, considering all the vitamins and minerals? It's affected by nutrition, there's no question about it. What is the future of cannabis in medicine and uh, what do you suggest to Slovenian colleagues? We'll have to wait and see, I think. And everybody does uh, what he does, according to his uh, commitments, according to his beliefs. It seems nowadays that there is a tendency to develop in in the direction of making more use of cannabis and cannabis-based interventions. Well, but we'll have to live and see it. Right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay.